Good afternoon. This is the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. For the record, this is Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019. And for the record, we do have a quorum. Uh, we have a number of bills up today. Each bill presentation in today's agenda will be approximately 10 minutes in length. And please make arrangements that that should include question and answer period in that 10, 10 minute time period. And each bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in uh, a future bill. And all testifiers are asked to keep their comments brief since we have a very lengthy agenda. Uh, the first bill up is Senator Rosen's Senate File 843. Senator Rosen, could you bring your entourage up to the table? Yes. I kind of like it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You Thank can you, members. You begin anytime. Uh, Senate File 843 deals with Rapid End Tam Township in Blue Earth County. And back in 2010, it was declared a, a presidential disaster for some severe storms and flooding. FEMA approved the project to relocate the road with some advanced funding of 238000 The work was completed in 2014 with a total cost at 354000 all due to some additional requirements from FEMA. And uh, they apparently ran into some sensitive archaeological area, and this uh, FEMA made some new, um, some new demands on the project. And um, <laughs> if I have this wrong, Mr. Maurer will absolutely uh, <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. But so FEMA is now asking for their 238000 dollars returned and the uh, township appealed the decision because they're not capable of course to pay this so the the bill is fairly for uh, you know straightforward it's uh, for three hundred forty thousand dollars we're appropriating to the general fund for the DPS back to rapid rapid in township and then the it has to be paid back at um, um, 238000 back to the uh, FEMA. And there is a project difference that we are asking, um, we are asking um, the township to pay the difference between the reimbursement of FEMA advance and state match and the total cost of the project. So with that, I have, as I said, I have um, Mr. Maurer, who is the Excuse me here. I got my sheet here. Thank you. Is the chief deputy for Blue Earth County Emergency Management and Chris Larson, the associate principal and civil engineer with ISG. And they were the engineering firm in Mankato that did the road construction design on this project. And Mr. Ray Cornelius is sitting down behind me. He's the chairman of the Rapid End Township Board. All right. Thank you, Senator. Um, let's go with Mr. Maurer first. Would you identify yourself for the record? Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representatives. I'm Mike Maurer. I'm the Chief Deputy on the Sheriff's Office, and I'm always also the Emergency Management Director for the Blue Earth County. And can you point that microphone directly at you? Oh, while you talk? There you go. I'm sorry. Um, it's all right. Uh, I, I, to give a brief uh, introduction, uh, what, what Senator Rosen said here is, again, is that uh, in 2010, we did get a presidential declaration, DR 1941, um, allowed for all public uninsured damage without in, with, uh, throughout the county to be um, claimed for uh, part of the disaster relief funds. Rapidan Township uh, did a extensive road project uh, due to um, the river bank sloughing a large amount of roadway away or a bank away from the roadway they ended up having to move the roadway one of the issues was is that there was a potential archaeological dig in that area um, they had it tested several times um, followed the rules of FEMA guideline and uh, moved forward with their construction project um, after the project was completed FEMA came in and checks it with uh, Google Maps and said that the project had encroached onto their uh, archaeological dig further than they had recommended. 
Um, this is not factual. They're using Google Maps. We have the uh, our um, firm that's with the architectural firm that did all of the um, design work that can prove that they stayed well within the right of way. Um, Rapidan Township appealed it twice. They got uh, then uh, Congressman Walls involved and. Uh, he attempted to bring it forward, um, and once the appeals process is done, it's done. They don't. You're, 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 with FEMA, you get two chances, and you're it, and then it, it's over. Rapidan Township asked several times to send a representative out. They failed to do so. They said it, it was done a specific way, and um, they've been told that they need to refund the FEMA funded them for a $354,000 project. FEMA funded them about 238,000 bucks. Now they have to send it back. Um, if they don't return it, they're not eligible for any funding in the future um, if we have any disaster declarations. So um, for additional details, uh, I can turn it over to Chris here. He can help fill you in. But they've done everything within their power. And there is past practice from Roseau County. This happened to them several years back. And uh, this is the process Roseau County County went through to help them to be uh, get the funds reencumbered. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Mauer. Uh, Mr. Larson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris Larson with ISG. We're the design firm out of Mankato, and thank you, Mr. Chair and um, committee members, for having us here today. Uh, and out of respect for our time constraints, I'll um, truncate my statement a little bit. Um, uh, concur with everything Chief Deputy Maurer has said. The uh, township contracted with the surveyor after uh, FEMA, through a state historic preservation office, um, reviewed, um, determined that there was this archaeologically sensitive area. The surveyor uh, established the approved alignment or the alignment that was approved um, by FEMA. That's when we came in. Uh, we designed the road, and <coughs> constructed it within that same alignment. And when I say alignment, I mean a 66 foot wide swath of land that generally follows the center line of the road. Um, again, FEMA decided that we didn't by simply looking at Google Maps. In our uh, appeals, uh, we provided exhibits with GPS uh, survey grade data showing that we stayed within that alignment, but um, they continually denied it. Part of the difficulty we ran into is that it was never the same person or group of people through these FEMA appeals. It was always different people reviewing it electronically. They wouldn't come to the site. Um, one little anecdote is that they, they had somebody uh, nearby in Wasika, 40 miles away, reviewing another FEMA disaster. They called back to their home office in Chicago, say, I'm 40 miles away from this rapid end site. Should I go take a look? And he was told to come home. So they, they were very close and still wouldn't, wouldn't come. Um, I have additional details, you know, and, and if you have questions, um, but again, I concur with Chief Deputy Maurer's statements and would also like to add that the uh, Minnesota um, uh, Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management has been with us the whole way as well and believe that the, the process would follow, was followed correctly. All right. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Are there any questions? Senator Johnson. I'll make this brief, Mr. Chair, but thank you. And I, I do know in Roseau County, that was before my time, but I know they're still dealing with some of the issues that came up when, with the reimbursement uh, for costs that they had. And I know the, the chair graciously put that in his bill uh, two years ago with some appropriation, but we're still, even in Roseau County, short, I think, $1.3 million still on, on those and really hurts our small counties and, and those people working in there. So I uh, appreciate Senator Rosen bringing this forward, I think it's something we need to address. Uh, I have a question. Um, is there a time limit that FEMA has given you to get the money back? No, there is no real time limit. They just said that they're not eligible for any funding um, until they pay it back. So any other disasters, I, uh, the township chair is here, but as I know it right now, it is no timeline. It's just if you don't pay it back, you can't, aren't eligible for any further funding. All right. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Hearing none, uh, Senate File 843 will be laid over. Mr. Chair. For possible inclusion. Yes, Senator I, Rosen. Um, I'm just, just wondering if this should just go to finance. Um, as a separate standing bill? Mm -hmm. um, we could consider that. Um, any discussion on that? Do we have a motion? Uh, Senator Dietzik moves that Senate File 843 be recommended to pass and move directly to the Finance Committee. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion prevails. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you, you very Senator much, Rosen. Members.
Senator Weber. Senator Weber, Senate thank you, Mr. File 1506. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present file, Senate File 1506. Uh, basically, uh, the request here is for $3 million in fiscal year 2020 appropriated from the general fund to the Commissioner of Public Safety for the Director of Homeland Security Emergency Management Division to award grants in equal amounts to emergency management departments in 87 counties, 11 federally recognized tribes, and four cities of the first class. Uh, as you are well aware, every county is mandated to have emergency management, uh, emergency management organization. And uh, certainly our counties, uh, some of the larger ones, have more than one person. Uh, many of our counties have a single person. Uh, many of our counties have a person uh, in a part-time position with other duties as assigned. And in some instances, counties uh, wind up sharing an emergency management officer. If you look at the events that have happened, in the last couple of years, whether we're talking about uh, tornadoes or windstorms, whether we're talking about excessive rains and flooding, excessive snow and resulting flooding, uh, our emergency management people have been taxed very hard in terms of the work that they have had to do as they deal with numerous emergency declarations. And, uh, and as a result, it has become uh, one of those instances that has certainly uh, brought about a shortfall of county resources in many instances to deal in those, with that situation. And the purpose of this bill is to get some additional money out into these management organizations to help them in that regard. I have with me today representatives of Norman County, Brown County, and, and the Association of Minnesota Counties. And first, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, turn it over to Gary Johnson of the Norman County Environmental Services Office. Mr. Johnson, welcome right. to the committee. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Gary Johansson. You're close. Oh, sorry about it's that. It's close. Add an A in there. Um, I am Norman County's emergency manager. I'm also uh, AMEM, or Association of Minnesota Counties, um, first vice president on the board of directors, and also AMEM's government affairs committee member. Um, I want to thank the chair and committee members for taking the time to hear our testimony this afternoon. Um, I'm going to just briefly touch on a few current funding issues affecting our local emergency management programs. Um, there's a lack of stable and sustainable funding for local emergency management planning and operations. Uh, local governments are heavily dependent on federal grants. My county, Norman County, receives $16,000 a year from the federal government to run a full-time program. Now, that $16,000 is matched by the county board. Uh, but still $32,000 to run a full-time emergency management program isn't a whole lot. Uh, natural disasters are not only increasing, but increasing in intensity in Minnesota. Uh, due to the continued federal budget resolutions, counties do not have a commitment on the level of grant funding until halfway through the local fiscal year, making budgeting and other financial planning difficult. So, if we are fortunate enough to have this funding bill come to a vote and pass, I vision this emergency managers across Minnesota using the funding in a variety of ways. I see my county, Norman County, using the funding to buy needed emergency management equipment or to catch up on with essential trainings and exercises required yearly in my county. My duties and responsibilities as an emergency manager in Norman County follow the same guidelines and training standards that are required in large metropolitan cities. However, my role as an emergency manager is part-time only. Emergency management is a critical government function. We as emergency managers do not rush to the scene of a disaster. We make sure the community is prepared by writing preparedness plans and doing trainings and exercises, and most importantly, supporting the responders with resources when they need them. Our role at the end of a disaster is recovery. A disaster may last days or weeks. Recovery lasts months and years. We are the recovery boots on the ground for our communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, Senator Weber, uh, who would be your next person to get uh, Next, uh, we will have, uh, also from Norman County, County Commissioner Steve Bombersbach. Mr. Bombersbach. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, my name is Steve Bombersbach. I, I 
I've been a Norman County Commissioner. I'm starting my 23rd year as a County Commissioner in Norman County. Um, I, I don't know if this is a stat we're proud of, but I believe we're, we're a county that has uh, led in federal and state declarations of disasters with 29 um, over our, our history. Um, so we're very familiar with disasters. Um, we deal with them quite often, and in my tenure, I've uh, dealt with several of them over, over my uh, time of service with Norman County. I want to kind of basically tell a story. Uh, back in 96, I was elected to the office of Norman County Commissioner and really didn't have a whole, idea, a whole lot of idea of what I was getting into. Um, if you all recall, back in 96, 97, it was one of the horrendous snowfalls we had in the Red River Valley. Norman County is located in northwestern Minnesota along the North Dakota border along the Red River. We had over 100 inches of snowfall, and uh, I remember it distinctly because it was about this time of the year. I was up at Polk County for a meeting. I was coming home, and, and we had beautiful weather, 50s, 60s, and the snowpack was melting. And then we got a rain on top of that, and then we started to have the flooding situations where the ice jams broke out and inundated our county seat. Uh, we had water flowing through the communities, through the town, and uh, during that experience, uh, I remember getting back from my meeting, uh, having to rush over and declare our fir my first declaration of uh, a natural disaster, and walking through water to get uh, uh, to the meeting place in our highway department. So it was a wide uh, open, opened my eyes to a, of a lot of situations that I wasn't prepared for, and I don't believe back then we as a county were as prepared as we could have been, even though they did a fantastic job. A couple days later, the temperatures dropped, the uh, water turned to ice, the power went out, the power was fed from North Dakota into our communities, and we had to start evacuating people out of the community. And it's a pretty sad day when you're loading people in payloaders out of nursing homes to evacuate. So I've seen those type of situations. And I guess that's why I'm passionate about this bill, um, not just for Norman County, for all counties. Uh, a lot of the counties in greater Minnesota that, like you heard earlier, we don't have those kind of resources and funds to probably be as prepared as we could be. Um, and like I say, it's, uh, it was an eye opener. We did a lot of things good. We didn't have any loss of life. But I always, I always figure this is the one place as elected officials, as you as senators, myself as county commissioners, that we can spend the taxpayer's dollar on preparation and mitigation and to, to have uh, our, make it available to our citizens to have a safe uh, situation when a disaster arises. Because there's many forms of disasters. I mean, we have the trains with oil on them, we have semis going through our communities with farm chemicals and such. And, and I see that the, since I've been on the board for 22 years, is you have a turnover in personnel, both at the county levels and the county staffing, in the first responders, the ambulance, fire departments, and so forth. So the training is key. And I think we, you know, it would just be valuable to have those additional funds to prepare our first responders for those incidents so that we don't have a loss of life and we can keep everyone safe. And I guess that's what I would close in. And I thank you for your time and I thank you for your consideration. Um, I know you guys get lots of requests for funding, but to me this is a small amount of dollars to protect the citizens of, of Minnesota. Okay. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, is Lane Sletta here? I'm here, Mr. St oh, Lane and uh, Carly Stark, if they could come up. We've got about a minute and a half left for your testimony and uh, and questions. Okay, Mr. So, Mr. Stewart? Stark. Uh, my name or is I'm Mr. Sletta. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm Lane Sletta. I'm the Brown County Emergency Management Director. I've been the director for 13 years, and uh, I have 32 years in the emergency management business. Um, I also support uh, full funding of the emergency management. Um, we really need this money and um, we will use it to uh, buy equipment, 
go to additional training um, and to um, basically uh, improve our situation. And I'll turn it over to uh, Carly. Ms. Stark, would you identify yourself? My name is Carly Stark. I'm the Public Safety Policy Analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties. The Association of Minnesota Counties represents the interests of all 87 counties in the state of Minnesota. As you have heard, there is a lack of stable funding for state and local emergency management planning and operations. Um, emergency management is intended to protect all citizens, but the way it's currently funded, communities of greater financial means get more protection, despite the fact that all citizens deserve equal protection. So we, um, we believe counties should be properly funded for emergency management, which requires a partnership between state, county, and federal governments, and we urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions, if there are any. Senator Ingerbritson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Real quickly, uh, the bill describes the uh, uh, 87 counties, uh, 11 federally recognized tribes, as well as four cities. I'm assuming the four cities are Minneapolis, St. Paul, Roche Rochester, and Duluth. Is yes. that correct? Yes. And do I understand that the federally recognized tribes receive money if they're obviously they, they still reside in within a county? Yes. So they, they all 11 of them, and they required also, also, and I'm assuming they do, because I think the letter we have here, uh, they have emergency preparedness programs that are set out in there, each each of the tribes? Yes, they do. Yes. Okay, Mr. Thanks. Joe yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, and members, there is a letter from the Grand Portage Reservation Tribal Council that explains um, how this works in their area and on reservation councils. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we'll uh, consider this bill as a layover bill for possible inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Senator Weber. Senator Torres Ray. I'm going to ask that uh, Senator Torres Ray and Senator Eichhorn approach the table together. We'll be considering Senate File 515 and Senate File 1736 at the same time. There's the sign in chief. And I will have Senator Torres Ray introduce her bill. Senator Torres Ray, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for the opportunity uh, to present Senate File 515. Ms. Torres Ray, or Senator, do you need more chairs at the table? Just yes. I see that you have quite a few yes, people Chair. with you in support of your bill, you and we can bring you a have. couple more chairs up. Thank you. Senator Torres, you can begin. Thank you. Again, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I am truly honored to be here, and I am honored that Representative Mary Kunish Podin and the Advocates for Indigenous Women have asked me to carry this bill. With you, Mr. Chair, with the Indigenous peoples who are here, and with all the members of this committee and the members of the Senate and the House, we need to be in a stronger voice for missing and murdered indigenous women in Minnesota and indigenous women around the country. There are many indigenous women who have fallen through the cracks of history into a broken legal system that has disregarded their rights and the rights of their children. We can continue, cannot continue to ignore our indigenous women and pretend that these problems do not exist. I would like to put this in perspective, Mr. Chair and members. Native women suffer from violence at a rate of two and a half times greater than any other population in this country. One in three Native women, one in three Native women will be raped in her lifetime. Four in five will be victims of a violent assault. And in some regions in the state of Minnesota, members, Native women are murdered <coughs> at more than 10 times the national average. More than 40% of Native children experience two or more acts of violence by the age, the age of 18. And there also are the unsolved cases of missing Indigenous women 
the many Native women and girls that we don't know about. But these statistics members only define part of the scale of the problem. They do very little to convey the magnitude of the problem. They only tell part of the story. They fail to account for the devastating impacts of violence on survivors, on Indian families, on Native communities, and Indian nations themselves. Members, we have not made it a priority to develop an accurate database that identify our women as Native women. We have made their ethnicity invisible. Members, it is time that we address the high rate of violence against indigenous women. We must find ways to fill the gaps in law enforcement that exist between tribes, municipal, and federal authorities. The task force that we propose in Senate File 515 is one step. It will require a report on issues related to violence within indigenous populations and recommend ways to reduce violence against our native women and girls in the state of Minnesota. This task force will provide suggestions for appropriate methods to track and collect data and then provide measures necessary to reduce and address violence against our native women. Mr. Chair and members, I have the honor to present to you our testifiers. And first in the agenda, I have Mrs. Mary Lyons. Ms. Lyons, welcome to the committee. You can begin any time. Would you identify yourself first? I'm going to read this, otherwise you'll be here all afternoon because I'll That's refuse fine. to go up the mic. That's fine. Say that with great humor because I know it. Um, after lunch, everybody's pretty tired, so I'm going to use a little humor every now and then to wake you guys up. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for sharing the space to addressing the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Bill. My name is Great Grandmother Mary Lines. I'm a Nishinaabe and enrolled member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I would like to share why this is so close to home for me. I think a bit of family history is in the order to speak of so that you might better understand who we are as a people. My mother, a beautiful young woman living on her territories in a healthy, happy family, which is now known as the Leech Lake Reservation. Our people were rich in family and community, but the outside white world thought differently. She and her siblings were ripped from their homelands to be educated in the white society so they could live a better life. She was placed into a boarding school, a religious institution, a place where she was to be safe and to be educated to the likes of the white man's expectations. During this time, the unthinkable, the unspeakable ugliness happened to her. She was victimized by rape, beatings, and enslavement. Can you imagine what that does to one's self-esteem, your self-worth? Can you imagine what it did to her trust in the converting to the white man's way of life? Can you? In the early 1900s to the mid-1900s, there was no therapy for these indigenous women. To seek help for their emotional scarring, nor did anyone care or admit to the wrongful doings that happened to the children of the Removal Act. Healing, the way we understood this, had been outlawed. It was only until 1978 the Indian Religious Act became legal for our people to do what we have been doing since the beginning of time. So she sought out alcohol as it numbed the pain, took her away from the night terrors until she became so dependent on it. Even though she married, had children, some of the children had fetal alcohol syndrome with severe disabilities and extreme vulnerabilities. Well, my mother died young from a diabetic coma related to alcoholism, leaving behind young children that would also be taken, placed into institutions facing the same malice of care. My younger sister, her youngest daughter, a child that was only three years old when my mother died, and was raised in foster care, had a not so good life as well. To fast forward her life to her death, let me share the connection of why this bill must be passed and acted upon. On December 31st of 1989, 
That evening, my younger sister, Catherine Louise Jones, went home to change and returned to an evening of fun at the Minneapolis American Indian Center at Sobriety Power, Pow Wow to celebrate her one year anniversary of sobriety. That was the last time we seen her alive. She went home with her baby and my older sister to change. They walked into her apartment to find her estranged boyfriend in the house, drunk, holding a knife. My older sister reported that he lunged at our younger sister while she was holding their son and began stabbing her. She dropped the baby and my older sister went into shock. He continued to stab her to death and her frail body was opened as if she just had heart and abdominal surgery. Then he ran out the door. The baby climbed on top of his mother. Crying. And wanting her to embrace him. Comfort him as he often did when he was hurt and scared. Excuse me. You can take all the time you want. The neighbors called the police, as they often did, and within moments they came with an ambulance and fire department. My elder sister was still in shock that left her body frozen. The baby was drowning in his mother's blood, and his little arms were stuck in her ribs when the fireman came in. He said he had to break her rib cage to release his little arm and resuscitate him. But <clears throat> that evening could have been prevented. There is no doubt in my mind that she'd still be he alive today if the police officers in the past 10 months prior to her death would have done their jobs the correct way. Excuse me. My younger sister had restraining orders on this man, and every time he showed up, she called the police, and they would dismiss the situation. At one time, a police officer told her to stop taking him back and misleading him. A week prior to this tragedy, he showed up pounding on her door in the middle of the night, and she called the police. The police came. She showed him the restraining order, and they just told him to go home, and this was their final warning. If the police would have just arrested him, she would still be alive today. He had a number of violations, thank you, dismissing this restraining order, which would have put him in jail. But my sister, a woman of color, a boyfriend that was Caucasian, wasn't on fair ground when it came to protection, and no, it was not a domestic. He was stalking her, and the courts knew this, nor would she taken him back as the police assumed. I have raised her three sons, her three boys, the boys that should have called her mom and not me. These boys grew into men. The eldest chose not to have children as the scars are deep. The middle son carries distress and has never fully healed and relieves, relives her death over and over again every New Year's Eve. The baby boy that nearly died with her on that tragic night grew up went into the Marine Corps and had a family. Today he is out of the Marine Corps on a medical after two terms. He suffers from severe post-traumatic stress. He does not know how to handle arguments with his wife as he fears he might carry the same ill will <clears throat> as his biological father had done. So in order to keep her and his son sa safe, he chooses to walk away from a marriage as he feels it's unfair to her of his pain that he cannot heal from. The list of what these young men have gone through and continue to is difficult and certainly unfair justice. I cannot even begin to tell you the cost the county has paid out for the care of these three boys. I raised them in a relative foster care situation so that I could continue to get the help that they each needed. I have since worked in foster care and adoption for decades and have heard many stories such as mine. The children have lost all hope of belonging in a safe, healthy environment. The dismantling of families still continues. 
My fear is that the many unidentified or homeless women, youth, transgender, LGBT, that are murdered, their unsolved murders lay dormant in boxes somewhere. GGS reported in 2017 in Minnesota, approximately 185 children each week go into foster care. Over 50% of Minnesota's homeless youth have been in foster care or adopted. In Minnesota, approximately 2,000 children age out of the foster care system every year, of which 38 do not have a plan to get health insurance, a job, housing, or even a driver's license. The majority of these children have diagnosed that classify them as vulnerable adults, and this information gets lost when they turn 18. The majority of indigenous women that fell through the cracks were in generational out of plane, <clears throat> out of generational out of home placement such as foster care or adoption. And through their medical history, they too were classified as vulnerable adults. On a closing night, on a closing note, we must embrace another truth. Many of the missing and murdered indigenous women were going to school, working, and even in healthy relationships. They weren't drunks, drug addicts, prostitutes, unfit individuals of society, as many may think. Their only fault was they were indigenous and no one cared to investigate or assume legal jurisdiction of their cases. Which would say we have murder, murderers walking free out there, just waiting to victimize again. I want to thank you for listening to my family's journey. And I encourage each one of you to please pass this bill. Jimmy Gwich, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. We'll now move on to uh, Misty Babineau. I had the pleasure of meeting her out in the hallway right before our committee hearing. Hello. Oh, this is awkward. I'm going to go sit over there. Ms. Good Babineau. afternoon, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Would you please identify yourself for the record before you begin? My name is Misty Babineau. I'm a climate justice organizer with Minnesota 350. I'm an enrolled member of the Red Lake Nation with descendancy to Leech Lake. I thank you for your time and your patience and listening to the testimony today. This is 500 years in the making. was raped for the first time by my foster dad at the age of nine. I was saved from the foster care system at the age of 12. I went home to Cass Lake and I witnessed my grandmother being murdered in front of me. Her attacker came after me. I still have the scars on my hand from where I grabbed the knife from my chest. She was trying to kill me. In my early 20s, I was kidnapped. I was taken over 60 miles away from my home. I was held at gunpoint and I was raped. But I fought and I'm here today. And I share these stories. There's so much violence. And I'm just one person. And when I speak to my sisters, they have stories so similar to mine. I beg you to do what you can so that this bill will be a standalone bill. It won't be a chip on the table at the end of the session. Your people deserve healing. Our communities deserve justice. And this is a step in the right direction. I printed out some copies of a report from the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is a division of the Seattle Indian Health Board. It's a snapshot of some data that has been collected from over 71 urban cities. Please, take, please read this. And I thank you for your time. We'll pass that out to our members, Misty. Thank you. Uh, the next individual up 
is Renee Ann Goodrich. Ms. Goodrich, welcome to the committee. Would you identify yourself for the record and then you may proceed. Bonjour, um, Jacate Ayajik, Indigo Ojibwe Moen. Bashkazibing Nandunjiba, Renan Goodrich, Shokanashimang. Um, greetings. Uh, my name is Renan Goodrich. I'm an elder, a tribal elder from Bad River, Wisconsin. Um, I've raised my children and I've lived in Minnesota for 40 years. I've just recently um, transferred, um, relocated back to Wisconsin. I'm um, <clears throat> I'm a family member of Survivor, an educator and an advocate, and, and, and an activist for, and a community organizer for um, creating events, community events in Minneapolis, um, down in Minneapolis and up in Duluth to bring awareness to uh, the missing and murdered indigenous women that uh, these events help to support the family members. And today I'm here to speak for families and to speak for my family. Um, I'm a survivor. I'm also a survivor, uh, first generation survivor from the public school system. My mom was in boarding school in Wisconsin. <coughs> uh, less than two years ago, I lost my daughter. So the, the pain and grief of um, losing a child is unimaginable. Um, we work I work as an advocate, a community advocate, supporting families to help bring awareness to this epidemic here in Minnesota. This year was was our fifth year for um, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Marches in Minneapolis and Duluth. And each year, family members come out and um, the event supports their grieving. It's a day of mourning. It's a day to honor. Um, their lost loved ones, and each year um, the attendance is growing. It keeps growing. It started off with four, four to six hundred, you know, uh, the first couple of years, and it's grown to the thousands. And these are families, community members um, that are in Minnesota, Wisconsin, but mostly in Minnesota, that are directly impacted by loss of their, their loved ones. And I'm here to ask you to please um, take a look at the data. Um, please reflect on the stories and the, that family are sharing with you about this, this grievous epidemic that is ongoing here in Minnesota. It's, it's not a new epidemic. It's a historical gender-based violence that has occurred, that occurs towards indigenous women and girls and are also our two-spirited community members. Um, and it's ongoing. Um, this has, um, this is a colonial gender-based violence that's was that has been occurring since 1492. So this is, is nothing new. But some of the new, uh, some of the things that are new uh, within this epidemic is some of the foundational um, reasons and that this epidemic keeps growing. Um, we know that one of the chief reasons for the missing, the murdered, the missing in our community, in our, commu our native communities, is the sex trafficking. Um, so 
we we realize that we have some data on that. The second that we're seeing, the second chief reason, one of the contributors to uh, the MMIW that is fairly new and recent, and it's felt to, throughout Minnesota, um, is the drug trafficking. So that's an area that's that needs some research and more investigation, is how does the drug trafficking contribute to the missing and murdered indigenous women's epidemic? There's multiple reasons behind um, and contributors to this epidemic, racism, um, the extraction industry, the trafficking, the historical gender-based violence and racism towards um, indigenous native women. And I'm asking, I'm imploring for you to please contribute to the solution of finding all the causes for what is contributing to this ongoing epidemic. This is an opportunity that you have to help families. Um, families, advocates, survivors, women of the Red Shawl, coalitions of the Red Shawl, have been working hard building movements, nonviolence, uh, violence against uh, Native women movements, um, marching in the streets in Minneapolis and in major cities throughout Minnesota, marching in the streets to bring uh, awareness to this epidemic um, in Native communities for years, years to decades to bring about the visibility that's needed for this epidemic. We need to be looking at what are some of the fundamental and the core issues that are impacting and contribute to the missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's through this data collection and research and the opportunity to be able to do some training that will help support um, direct, um, direct support advocates to families that we're going to discover um, the, all of the main reasons that contribute to missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and here in Minnesota, um, we have the opportunity to do that. Um, several other states, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Washington, they're leading on um, their legislative um, endeavors that they're bringing forth, creating their own task force. Minnesota has been a leader in um, initiatives and legislation to, to protect Native women. And I, I'm asking, um, as a family, as a mother, a grandmother, to please um, move forward and, um, and pass this legislation in the same fashion that you have, that Minnesota always has in supporting Native women. And, and in that, we're supporting our families, we're supporting our Native communities, and the children. Um, within Native communities, we, we struggle with the historical trauma of the gender-based violence that has been here since 1492. But more, more currently, with the loss of even just a few of our Native women, our Native communities are felt, the impact is felt so strongly because the population is, is a small percentage of the population of Minnesota. I'm asking you to think about the children of the mothers that are lost, 
the mothers that are missing, the, um, never found, the ones that are found and that are brought home and that we take care of them. Think about the children because this is an ongoing um, epidemic that impacts the children. These mothers leave children behind and the children are left with this legacy that their mom was murdered or their mom never come home or, so we have the opportunity to address the main issues that are behind this epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women with the creation of this data and uh, to provide training to advocates that, that provide direct services to family members. So I'm asking you to please um, contribute to that and to move, to move this forward for, to help bring about the healing. Um, Thank you. One of the um, <clears throat> horrible realizations and the, the facts of um, missing and murdered indigenous women is that it's preventable. Uh, we lose our women, um, our mothers, our sisters, our aunties. I've lost three uh, sisters and my daughter uh, less than two years ago. One of the horrible facts is that this is, this is preventable. Um, <clears throat> the time when I went to go claim my daughter and to take care of her, and there was um, an examiner at the scene. There was no advocates. Um, I was there alone. I was there with the police officers. There was no protocol. And the police officers were very kind. Um, however, they, they seemed to lack the knowledge of what do I do now? And so I was sitting there, you know, on the street, on a curb, you know, after my daughter was taken away and off to the, um, the medical examiners and the police officers walked away. I, I was left sitting there on a curb in shock. So with, you know, we're asking for the appropriations, <clears throat> excuse me, we're asking for the appropriations that would uh, provide for training, training to law enforcement, um, possible pro appropriations that would provide um, advocates to be at the scene to support families, you know, about supporting families. And to also appropriate for uh, the, data collection so that we're able to address um, as advocates, direct service providers, um, some of these key contributor, contributors to this epidemic when we're working with families. So I wanted to say miigwech and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodrich. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted the audience to know we gave instructions to everyone that they would be given 10 minutes for every uh, individual bill presentation today. Uh, we're now at a half hour, uh, and I think it's timely since we haven't had this uh, bill heard in this committee that we gave more time. Uh, it's important for our committee members to know uh, the background, the history, and the scope and scale of the history that we're dealing with. And also in support of this legislation uh, is also Senator Eichhorn who has a similar bill. And I wanted to give him a moment to speak regarding his bill as well. Your bill is very similar, if not identical, to That's Senator Torres Ray. Right, Senator Eichhorn. 
Well, thank you for the opportunity today, Mr. Chair, to co-present Senate File 515 and, and 1736. And there's certainly been a lot of folks that have had interest in this. So I'd like to take a moment to thank not only Senator Torres Ray, but the other folks that have been a part of this, Senator Utke, uh, Senator Latz, yourself, Mr. Chair, and, and Senator Franzen. Just want to bring it back to what these bills are for a moment for the committee. The bill would create a, a task force to address violence against indigenous women. And it would bring individuals together from law enforcement professionals to prosecutors, to judges, to defense attorneys, to tribal government officials, non-government agencies, indigenous people, and most importantly, indigenous women would be a part of this task force. Uh, it appropriates a, a 105,000 in fiscal year 2020 and 45,000 in 2021 to put the task force together. And they would be tasked with discussing the systemic causes behind violence uh, that indigenous women and girls experience. They would discuss appropriate methods for tracking and collecting data, policies and institutions such as policing, child welfare, and other practices, measures necessary to address and reduce violence against indigenous women and girls, and measures that will help victims and their families. Um, one thing that, that I found very sad that, you know, nobody wants to know that trafficking is happening in their backyard and a lot of people unfortunately turned a blind eye to it, especially in indigenous communities. I have the Leech Lake Band in my district, uh, but just outside of my district is, is the White Earth and Red Lake. And there's the highway two that goes along there. And as I was doing my campaigning and touring around, I had heard for the first time the amount of women that are, are taken to sex trafficking. And that was absolutely devastating news uh, to hear that it's going on in our own backyard and it goes on in so many places around our state. And unfortunately, so many have turned a blind eye to that. And I think Senate File 515 and 1736 will go a long way to help that discussion get started, bring it out into the light and find solutions that will really be helpful for our indigenous peoples. And I think it'll send a message that, you know, Minnesota really cares about its indigenous population and, and its women. Uh, one statistic that I saw from the Urban Indian Health Institute that was also shocking was the low percentage of these cases that are even uh, reported to the database. There's, there was, uh, in 2016, 5,712 cases of missing indigenous females, but only 116 were logged into the Department of Justice database. So there's a lot of areas I think we can do better. And I think that this task force will go a long way to help helping that happen. And I'll just close by saying thank you again, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity for everybody to present and for giving extra time to hear these really important stories today uh, that, that really weigh heavy on a lot of our hearts. And, and hopefully we're able to include something in, in your bill this year, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Senator Eichhorn. Uh, we'll open it up for questions, if any, and then we've got to get back to our schedule. Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senators Eichhorn and Torres Ray for bringing this forward. One thing I do want to comment on, and I believe uh, uh, several of the testifiers referred to, is the issue that we have with out-of-home placements in the Native American uh, tribes. And this is something that we need to additionally look at because it can be the start of the fall of the person involved. And, and these people are taken out of their homes and put in foster care that does not understand, is not prepared to care for, and does not do a good job of taking care of them. And so this is something I think we need to also keep in mind, and I hope the task force does take a look at that very area, the reasons why the, the proportion of out-of-home placements, which I believe is about 10 times the average of the rest of the population. So this, this is a serious problem that we need, and I'm, I'm very glad that the task force is forming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, these bills will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus uh, judiciary bill. Thank you again, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you. I want to thank you uniquely uh, because you were the one who far first started this uh, focus and the first bill of this nature. And I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members. Um, for me, it has been a 35-year journey. When I came to this country, I was guided into the issues of child protection by Rose Robinson and other Native women who have worked in the child protection system their entire lives. 
So I learned through them about the child protection system and how children are removed from their homes mm -hmm. and understood the disparities that exist in this country, um, especially for Native women and for Native families and African Americans. So I am really privileged that I am here today to speak to you about this problem. And I um, wish that we could move this independently. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have talked to you as uh, uh, the possibility of moving this as a uh, standalone bill. Uh, the women have asked for that, and they would like to lead this effort, of course, with us and in collaboration with uh, all the members, um, but they would like to express a strong desire to um, have these bills moving independently. All right. Thank you, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll move on to the next bill, Senator Hall, Senate File 1638. <laughs> Senator Hall. Mr. Chair, um, we have before us Senate File 1638. I do have an author's DE amendment, <clears throat> if I could move that. Is that in our packets? Uh, we have to distribute that, Senator Hall. This is a DE amendment. I believe, is this the bill of first jurisdiction? Yes, so. it is. So Senator Hall moves the DE amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion uh, passes. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senate File 1638 aims to strengthen our state's EMS system by promoting telephone CPR training for 911 telecommunicators. Cardiac arrest is a medical emergency which happens in the first minutes of a, of a medical emergency can literally mean the difference between life and death. Immediate bystander CPR can triple a victim's chance of survival. So this bill basically does this. Uh, it trains telecommunicators in telephone CPR. So someone calls uh, 911 and they would expect, if not hope at least, that they would get somebody on the other end that would know how to do CPR and tell them how to do CPR. And in most cases, they're right. But around the state, they're not, uh, they don't have to be certified in that. And so this would change that and make that they would have to be certified in that. The DE amendment, if I can go to that quickly, does some minor changes in the uh, uh, correct technology uh, terms and definitions. Uh, it also clarifies uh, public duty doctrine and states that this is not create a special duty and clarifies the operator's uh, responsibility or liability. So with that, before we go into questions, if I could have my testifiers uh, quickly go into testimony. Who would you like to have first? Is it Ms. Uh, Ms. Schmidt? Ms. Schmidt. Would you identify yourself for the record? Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lorna Schmidt. I'm the Government Relations Director for the American Heart Association, and I'm here to offer our strong support for telephone CPR and Senate File 1638. We'd like to thank Senator Hall for his leadership on this issue, as well as, as his co-authors for their support. The goal of this legislation is simple, to save lives. Cardiovascular disease, which includes cardiac arrest, is the leading cause of death. Most cardiac arrests occur outside of the hospital and result in a call to 911. To survive and lessen the chance of disability, CPR must be started quickly in order to keep blood flowing to the brain and other organs. Every minute that passes without CPR, the chance of survival decreases by as much as 10%. This makes bystander CPR critical, especially when you consider that in many parts of the state, EMS response times can exceed 10 minutes. Bystander CPR can triple a cardiac arrest victim's chance of survival. In telephone CPR, CPR instructions provided over the phone by a 911 operator to a caller can increase bystander CPR. This bill presents public safety answering points, or PSAPs, with two options. To train their 911 telecommunicators in telephone CPR 
or to transfer cardiac arrest calls to another PSAP who is willing to provide CPR coaching for them. Coaching by 911 operators is not a new idea. It was decades ago when medical dispatch centers across the country started adopting protocols to talk callers through medical emergencies. Over the years, many PSAPs in Minnesota have done so, and in fact, both approaches outlined in this bill, providing instruction in-house and transferring calls, are already in place in various parts of the state and working well. This legislation would ensure that all PSAPs, at a minimum, can provide CPR instruction over the phone or quickly connect callers to someone who can. The public expects it, and these simple instructions can literally mean the difference between life and death. Telephone CPR can turn bystanders into lifesavers, and it's beneficial regardless of whether a caller has had past CPR training. Witnessing a cardiac arrest can be an incredibly stressful experience, especially if it's a loved one. But with the right training, 911 operators can help callers stay calm, focused, and overcome common challenges. Things like recognizing what is a cardiac arrest, a hesitation to act, or the fear of hurting someone by doing CPR wrong. In Minnesota, we've made good progress toward increasing bystander CPR rates by requiring CPR training in high school and through community trainings, but there is room for improvement and telephone CPR can help us get there. Senate file 1638 will save lives. We ask for your support and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Um, and the next is uh, Ashley Gote. Getty. I, Getty. I'm sorry. Please okay. go ahead. Would you identify yourself for the record first? Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Ashley Getty and I am from West St. Paul. My family personally experienced the benefits of telephone CPR and I appreciate the opportunity to share our story with you today. I was 39 weeks pregnant and sleeping, scheduled to be induced the next day when I awoke to what I thought was my husband, Andrew, snoring. I tried to wake him to get him to change position and I quickly realized something was wrong. Andrew was not responding and he was gasping for air. I called 911. Andrew had otherwise been a healthy 28 year old with no signs or symptoms of anything being wrong. I didn't know what was happening and I needed someone to tell me what to do. The operator identified that Andrew was in cardiac arrest and told me we were going to start CPR. She asked me if I could get Andrew onto the floor but he was too big for me to move by myself at that point in my pregnancy. Without missing a beat, the operator told me to remove the pillow from beneath Andrew's head and she started coaching me through chest compressions right there on the bed. She told me where to put my hands on his chest, to press hard, and helped me keep a beat. It was 10 minutes before first responders and the ambulance arrived, though it felt a lot longer. I was in the following hours, Andrew went through a number of tests and procedures and I was told to prepare for the worst. I canceled my appointment to be induced at a different hospital and stayed by his bedside. Doctors soon discovered that Andrew had been born with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, a rare condition in which an extra electrical pathway in the heart causes a rapid heartbeat. By the next day, he was miraculously on his way to making a full recovery, and I was induced into labor with Andrew in his own hospital bed right next to me. Ours is a story with a happy ending, a family of three going home together to start a new life together. We are so thankful for the doctors and first responders that helped us, including that 911 dispatcher who first helped me start CPR. The doctors told me Andrew wouldn't have survived without it, and though I had been trained in CPR before, it was 12 years ago, and in that moment, I needed someone to tell me what to do and to reassure me that I was doing it right. At the time, I didn't realize that not all 911 operators are trained to help people do CPR. Like most people, I assume that it was routine. Now I realize I'm lucky that the person who answered my call was able to give me that extra instruction. I don't know what I would have done without it and no one should have to. Telephone CPR helped save my husband and I hope you'll support this bill and help make sure every caller like me can get the instructions they need to help a loved one in need. Thank you. Thank by you. The, by the way, this is her husband sitting this next to me. Yeah, we were wondering who he was, <laughs> but uh, did you want to make any comment? No, thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Senator Hall. Uh, we'll lay this over for possible inclusion. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I do not see Senator Rood in the room, so we're going to move on to Senator Bruce Anderson. Senate file 1118.
Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, appreciate the opportunity to present Senate File 118. Senate File 118 appropriates funds for veterans and their families from the general fund to the Commissioner of Public Safety for a grant to a domestic abuse prevention program, uh, so-called DAP. Since 1979, Domestic Abuse Project DAP has served the Twin Cities community with innovative and successful programming to end the intergenerational cycle of domestic violence. Domestic Abuse Project promotes safety and healthy family relationships by stopping domestic violence as it occurs and working to prevent it in the future. To achieve this mission, DAP, as it's abbreviated, provides counseling, case management, education, and advocacy to families affected by domestic abuse to give them the tools to transform their lives. In 2010, DAP created a unique program that specifically addressed the needs of service members called Change Step. This program has had an exceptional results with veterans and current or former service members affected by domestic violence as well as their families. And I have with me uh, three testifiers to testify on behalf of the DAP program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, would it be uh, Ms. Avery first? Yes. Uh, would you identify yourself for the record? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Annie Van Avery and I'm the Executive Director of Domestic Abuse Project. As Senator Anderson mentioned, we're commonly referred to as DAP. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. It's a privilege to be in front of the committee to talk about our organization and our unique therapeutic program for service members, Change Step. For 40 years, DAP has provided critical trauma-informed healing and advocacy to the spectrum of those impacted by domestic violence. From infants through our zero to three program to adolescents, adults, parents, caregivers, and specific to our request today, veterans and service members. DAP serves over 3,000 clients every year. We serve every member of the family and no one is turned away for lack of funds. We're here today to tell you about our unique men's program, specifically customized for past and current military service members, Changed Up. Changed Up has been developed through decades of proven success in giving men the tools they need to eliminate violent behaviors and replace them with behaviors that help build healthy relationships. The effectiveness of the Change Step program to be transformative in the lives of our participants is clear. 96% of veterans who complete our programs do not reoffend within one year. We know with additional resources, we could be serving more veterans, service members, and their families. DAP is unique in our work to address the intergenerational cycle of violence through therapeutic programs for each family member. Those using violent behaviors, survivors, and children affected by domestic violence. Change Step is an effective program that sets DAP apart and is, a, is critical, has a critical need in our collective work to build communities free from domestic violence. If there are no other questions at this time, Mr. Chairman and committee members, I'd like to introduce Amithani Keefe, Director of Client Services, and Jody Ship, Change Step Case Manager. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Avery. Uh, Ms. Keefe. Would you identify yourself yes. for the record before you Good afternoon, you begin? Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Amadini Keefe. I'm the Director of Client Services at DAP. I've also co-facilitated the Change Step Group, so I'm honored to be here to talk about our services for veterans. Change Step is a 24-session therapy program that incorporates military culture, teachings, and experiences. The program sessions include education around domestic violence, as well as group discussion about ways in which service members engage in unhealthy relationship dynamics. Our groups consist of veterans, many of whom have seen combat, have military trauma, or have experienced other traumas that have led to post-traumatic stress disorder. Change Step is unique in that we attend to the trauma veterans have experienced as a result of their military service. And while not an excuse for abuse, we understand how this trauma impacts and potentially enhances the lethality of violence in the home. We know that skills taught in the military are vital for the survival of the individual and the unit, However, when returning home, they may impede a service member's capacity to thrive as a civilian. 
A pillar of our understanding is that domestic violence is taught through our lived experiences, and a different way of engaging in conflict can also be taught and applied in relationships. Since the program began, 94 men have graduated from our Change Step program in Minnesota, and approximately 450 have graduated from Change Step groups facilitated through the Air Force Family Advocacy Program worldwide. At the close of group, service members have an increased capacity to express empathy for their partners, to recognize and identify cues to violence and de-escalate, to recognize and stop destructive self-talk, to accept responsibility for violence, and display a shift in attitudes that contribute to interpersonal violence. Mm -hmm. Our request today is that you offer your support in obtaining funding for the service, as well as supportive services for veterans' families. While our organization works with every member of the family, our philosophy is that domestic violence will not stop unless individuals that use abusive behaviors are held accountable and are provided with the opportunity to heal from their own traumas and unlearn the teachings that have led to their use of violence in the home. By doing so, we have an opportunity to truly end the intergenerational cycle of violence in our community. With the assumption that questions will happen at the end, I'd like to now introduce Jody Ship, our case management supervisor. Uh, Ms. Ship, would you identify yourself for the record? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm Jody Ship. I've been serving in the Minnesota Army National Guard for going on 15 years. I've spent most of my career as military police with multiple deployments. I came to the Domestic Abuse Project to support the Change Step program. I started by working one-on-one -on -one with the veterans. I started by helping them meet their own basic needs. I had found my niche. These veterans, I could relate to them. I needed someone that would listen without being judged, and I knew that that's also what they needed. Of all the veterans I have talked to, none wanted to hurt their partner or their family and somehow they still ended up in this situation. There is so much guilt and shame. It's really hard to move forward when you are carrying around that much guilt and shame. In the Change Step group, these vets get to process these emotions in a safe place with no judgment. As facilitators of the Change Step group, we do not get to decide what families should be separated or which families should stay together. We provide space for healing, and ending fighting in the family. We support each family uniquely. It can be a huge step when a guy walks in our front door. I'm gonna share a statement from a Change Step graduate. He had the courage to walk in our front door and I'm gonna respect his privacy by not sharing his name. I do have his permission to share this statement today. I served in the Marine Corps prior to being sent to the the Domestic Abuse Project to attend the Change Step program. I do believe it changed my life. The staff at the Domestic Abuse Project were wonderful and very helpful. I do believe that they went above and beyond to help with many things, including legal services, housing, and obtaining health care, just to name a few. I believe this program is important. I was dealing with the darkest part of my life when I walked in those doors. This was the first time I started to feel like a person again after being through the criminal justice system, jail, and several court dates. I was pretty nervous to get started. I thought it might be a little intimidating walking in a room with a bunch of what I thought were criminals. The counselors at DAP at the Domestic Abuse Project told me and my fellow veterans that just because we had used abusive behaviors didn't mean that we were continued to be seen as abusers. In other words, it didn't define who we were. This changed my way of thinking. We were given assignments to help us learn alternative ways of dealing with feelings that were coming out wrong. Frustration and anger are emotions that we all have, but we need to learn to deal with them differently. We shared answers to questions with fellow veterans and learned some of each other's stories. It was very important for me to hear that I wasn't the only person going through this and going through things that I didn't really understand. It was important to me to be in a safe place with people who had similar experiences as I did. There was camaraderie amongst the group and my fellow veterans that we wouldn't have had in a typical group of domestic violence offenders. The program, after I completed the program, I pursued individual counseling at the Domestic Abuse Project. 
the experience I have had at the Domestic Abuse Project changed the way I thought about myself and the way that I deal with people every day. I yield for questions. Thank you, Ms. Shipp. Um, is there any questions? Hearing none. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Thank you. We'll lay this Thank bill you, over for possible inclusion. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rood. Senator Rood, we miss you on the first flyover. Senator Limmer uh, and members, I had the most delightful group of FFA students in my room, and I just couldn't pull myself away. All so right. they are just absolutely wonderful. So <laughs> I well, apologize. You're I now in front here. of the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> uh, and you can begin whenever you wish. Thank you. Um, members, today I have Senate, five, Senate File 12. And this is a bill for uh, school safety. So uh, many of our schools around the state are different and they have different needs. So this bill ensures uh, safe schools across the state by allowing the schools to identify what their security needs really are. Uh, a school in Minneapolis might be different than a school in Pequot Lakes, might be different than a school in Hill City. And so uh, this bill appropriates $2 million to help the school security audits. Uh, in anywhere from 100 to 400 schools, depending on what the audits might cost. Many of the recommendations out of a school audit uh, have maybe little or no cost to implement them. They may be simply moving trash cans or making an exit more accessible or other ob obstacles that may be in the way. Or maybe just it's policy and procedural changes that they need to make. So in an e effort to maintain local uh, control, schools would be able to take the audit recommendations to their school board or their communities to secure funding for the upgrades that they may or, or maybe they don't need them, but if they do need them, um, through budget uh, enhancements and the school board could decide. So this bill helps to get the schools the information they need to do this and to make changes they need to uh, make our kids safe. Thank you, Senator Rood. And you have a testifier with you? I do. Mr. Doerr, would you identify yourself for the record? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Rob Doerr, and you may be familiar with me in certain capacities, but today I'm just uh, joining you as a uh, member of the community and a father of two kids in uh, public schools. And uh, <clears throat> this is actually a bill that I, I, I was happy to, to help kind of guide through the process uh, last legislative session. It had strong bipartisan support uh, and unfortunately was uh, vetoed. But, uh, but I appreciate this bill's approach in that it's not creating a, a whole new government program. It's not uh, some lasting expensive need. It allows schools, and particularly schools who may not have a, a, a strong budget to work with, to evaluate their own policies and procedures and their own physical infrastructure for possible needs. It's not unlike what the, the state capitol complex went through just a couple of years ago when they evaluated uh, all of the security needs of the state capitol. So this information is uh, then presented to the school, and uh, as Senator Root indicated, the school can then decide whether they're going to be using... Uh, uh, safe schools levy money or uh, they can approach their community through through a levy there or whether the school board wants to uh, finance that themselves but very often audits like this uh, reveal a lot of just behavioral and procedural things that can change my kids school itself has gone on uh, containment several times because a uh, because a hospital that's nearby with a mental health ward has had somebody walk off of the campus there's a wide array of potential threats that schools face and looking at this as a, as a how do we keep our kids safe from any sort of potential obstacle and uh, make sure that schools have the resources to evaluate that I think is a really uh, strong thing and I think this bill is a great way to go about it. Right. Thank you, Mr. Doerr. Uh, are there any questions for this bill? Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Um, um, there's already an existence a uh, state agency, the Minnesota School Safety Center, which exists for the purpose of assisting our school districts um, with uh, evaluating their security concerns and, and getting ideas on information on steps they can take uh, to improve their own physical security. 
Um, in fact, the governor uh, has um, a request in his budget for an additional $250,000 uh, each of the next two uh, years in order to uh, expand the staff uh, to meet the school's needs in Minnesota. They're currently making about 200 presentations a year is what, according to the budget, uh, the governor's budget information. So I'm trying to determine why uh, this grant program would be necessary rather than utilizing existing state resources uh, uh, to do this. It sounds really more like it's just an effort to privatize what's already an existing state okay. service. M Mr. Sir, Chair and, and Senator Lance, um, I, this actually gets the money to the schools. You know, um, it's not for FTEs. It's, it's really the schools can have a grant to use in their local community and um, they can hire a professional with certification to come into their school and look at their school and, and tell them what they need. And so it's really more the money getting to the schools rather than full-time employees for the bureaucracy. And uh, Mr. Dorf. Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Senator Latz, I, I, that's a good question. Uh, as of last year, the School Safety Center had uh, two employees, and I believe they were looking to add a third employee. And I can't remember how many states uh, schools we have in the state, but it, it's pretty significant. And I, I do actually I think that that's a right way to go to make sure that the schools are having these presentations. I think this, this bill attach, uh, attacks it a little bit differently, where they're actually doing a thorough assessment of that particular school's infrastructure and identifying any particular needs so I, I, I don't confess you know I don't believe that this is the only approach that can be taken but I think that a two or three person department is going to be pretty stretched trying to service the entire state so mr. chairman Senator Latz. Uh, the, the school safety center currently has three employees and and the governor's budget would propose to add an additional two employees um, but part of my question is uh, are the funds that are proposed in this bill uh, solely for the purpose of a security assessment, or are they also intended to be available for actual physical improvements in the school sites themselves? Senator Root. Mr. Chairman and Senator Latz, these are for the assessments. If the school were to need something um, um, for their uh, physical um, security that they needed to change, um, I, we, they would go to their um, school board or their community um, for those funds. And this, so this is really just for the security assessment to really get those people into their schools um, to tell them what they need to do. Okay. Um, Mr. Lapp. Chairman, um, what is the basis for the dollar amount that was selected here? Sir Root? Um, you know, I'm not, um, this is from last year, so I don't remember. <laughs> this is the groundhog bill, so I, I'm not exactly sure uh, where we came up with the yeah, the Mr. Dorf. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Latz, I, I believe we we just evaluated the cost of what it would what it would take to to uh, assess a school, and so having talked to people who work in this uh, in this field, it was anywhere between several thousand dollars to up to about twenty thousand dollars to do an assessment uh, for for a campus, depending on its size and and uh, in, and its makeup. And the idea was, how many schools do we want to help? And I think uh, Senator Rood landed on uh, between. 100 to 400 was was a good initial target just as this limited program goes just to see over the course of a couple years how many schools are helped and then the legislature could reevaluate it and see whether more funding was needed or whether the program uh, uh, was performing at its expectations. Right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, as, as we evaluate the request, I think um, it would be incumbent upon us to have a more detailed analysis Maybe it's available and we just don't have it in front of us, but a more detailed analysis of an average cost of assessing a school, if the goal is to have every campus throughout Minnesota, every elementary school, middle school, junior high school, and high school um, audited in this way, uh, whether or not it, it's going to cost $1,000 or $20,000 to do this kind of an audit, I think that's one heck of a range. Uh, aiming for 100 to 400 schools is also one heck of a range. Um, and uh, I think before we can make any kind of, of a uh, legitimate analysis of whether this would be $4 million well spent in taxpayer dollars, we need to have 
that kind of underlying projection, in, in essence, a fiscal note kind of analysis, but a, a more detailed than what we have um, available in front of us today before we can determine if this is the best way to spend the money. Um, and uh, I would respectfully suggest uh, two things. One is uh, the fact is that we can't harden our schools, every one of them, enough to prevent an active shooter attack. Um, short of putting up a prison wall around every school and having guards at gates for entry, um, you're not going to be able to do what you really need to do if you want to completely protect all of the students and teachers and staff that are in a school building. And even then, unless they live on site in that facility, they'll be coming and going every day, uh, which means anyone who wishes to cause harm to those uh, persons uh, could do so at the beginning of the school day or at the end of the school day as people are coming and leaving. Uh, so there really is no way to harden our schools enough uh, to prevent um, attacks and, and harm. Uh, it seems to me that the money and the energy would be much better spent on prevention. Um, this bill is not going to be satisfactory, you know, whatever good it might do, and I'm sure it, it could slow things down, it could help people get to a safe place, maybe reduce uh, loss, um, but uh, it's not going to be sufficient to prevent uh, harm from occurring, um, nor can everyone be this vigilant every hour of every day um, as they go through the school day either. And frankly, there's a concern that, you know, kids in schools are traumatized uh, perhaps uh, quite substantially um, just by going through the drills and, and being afraid every moment they're in school that every time they walk in, they got to go through some kind of security protocol that will remind them that they're walking into a hardened site rather than an elementary school and kind of hard to focus on learning, I suppose, uh, when we do that. Um, frankly, we need to do more to keep the guns out of the hands of dangerous people in the first place. Um, and this bill, no matter how much we try to, uh, to or how much others may try to say it's a substitution for meaningful gun violence reduction, uh, it will not accomplish that goal. Uh, we need things like expanded background checks and extreme risk protection orders to accomplish that goal. Um, so, uh, and we know that 87% of gun owners agree on that as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope that this bill is not viewed in any way as a substitute or as a panacea or as an alternative and is not utilized to claim it's an alternative to, uh, uh, to those two uh, gun violence reduction bills that I'm authoring. Um, if anything, it may be viewed as a complement to, uh, but uh, I think it's incumbent upon uh, this body to take other steps to hear the whole picture and look at all possible solutions in public hearings, uh, not just throw money at security assessments and then build walls or more walls um, or bulletproof glass in our schools. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On this point, Senator Anderson. Uh, to that point, uh, I think when I, if I remember being on, when I was on the Education Committee, there's got to be at least 360 school districts, districts not schools. I'm sure there's more schools than the districts are, but 360 plus, I'm, I just kind of did a, a divide, and it's about 11,000 per school district out of this 4 million that we're talking about for an audit. And it's probably going to be more than that because you're going to talk about um, the, the schools themselves being audited. So I think this is kind of a, a basis for uh, at least helping school districts look at going forward with doing an audit on their schools. Okay. On this point, Senator Ingerbritson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Root, for bringing this forward. I, I certainly understand it being utilized for an audit. In fact, we've talked about this over the last couple of years. Uh, there's also schools that, that have already accomplished what they set out to do for security. Uh, some of the comments Senator Latz brought forward uh, uh, I understand and I understand his passion for 
for the uh, the bills that he has. Uh, however, to say that this is not prevention, uh, just an interesting little thing happened to me this weekend when my when I was at home. My seven year old, I think first grader, I think she's in first grade, has got a card hanging on her jacket, and I asked her what it was for, and and she said, well, that's to get on the bus. It's a card reader. You get on the bus, so they the driver knows that. You can really be on the bus, and you actually belong on this bus. And I thought, wow, that's 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 a good idea. You know, we always talk about kids being abducted or yeah, familiar uh, abductions from family members or whatever. And uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, so that also is a card to get in the front door of the school if I'm outside. She said it was kind of kind of cute. She was proud of it, but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, wow, these schools are really doing th some things to to at least prevent somebody from at least rushing, you know, in the front door. Uh, is it going to stop everything, Senator Latz? No, it's not going to. If somebody wants to get in, they're going to get in. But uh, I know that last year, I think the numbers were, Mr. Chair, I, I, think, I think we were talking about there was about a $250 million need, and I might be wrong on that, for hardening of all the schools or at least there was at least that much, that many requests. And we were funding it, I think, $25 million here and $25 million there. I'm not sure if the governor has anything in his budget this year. I know we do. We have in our budget target, I think there was $75 million in new dollars for hardening schools. But to have a professional audit come in there and, and actually, you know, look at the garbage cans and look at the corners and where you need cameras is a great idea. So. This is a this is one step of the one tool that we can use to help secure our schools. So thank you. I know our committee is anxious to get into a long debate. We have three bills left for Mr. Their Chair, ten minutes. Yeah, I would just like to make just a, a comment on the, the size of the school and the cost. Every school is different. In my district, I have one large school district, Brainerd. Their costs for their school audit may be different than McGregor, which is a very small school, or Hill City. And so when we did the uh, we did an average of schools, and not every school is going to uh, uh, apply for these. And I will tell you that school security is not just about guns. School security is the parents who are getting a divorce and have to drop off their children, and it's and so that there's that 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 the right parent gets the the child, and how does that happen, and, and that we know who is in the school building and the cameras, and so it's not just about hardening our schools for guns. There are so many other security issues that happen in a school that we use to make our children safe, just like the on the bus, the cards. That's a great idea, and for a small school district, that might be the perfect answer. So it's not all about um, hardening our schools for guns. It's about a security audit and where it is that they can make our students safer. Right. Sarah Pappas. All right. Sarah Latz. I'll give you the last word. The chairman has given me the eye to be brief, <laughs> and I will. Thank you. Um, I don't mean to suggest that these audits would not be helpful. I'm sure that they would. And, you know, my kids, you know, go to schools where they've got some security measures in place, too. And, and I respect that, and I think that's important. Um, but uh, I think we also need to look upstream to prevent the violence itself from occurring rather than simply trying to prevent the impact of an attack uh, once it begins. Um, this may be helpful. It would not be sufficient, Mr. Chairman. All right. I hope that we broaden our look. Thank you. Sir thank Ruth, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We'll lay Appreciate this bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Uh, next is Senator Dietzik, Senate File 1158. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Senator Dietzik. You can begin any time. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairs and Members. Thank you for hearing Senate File 1158, and this is a bill to fund a grant for emergency responders to help deal with crisis situations. We heard a similar bill several years ago to fund training to learn cues for 
to recognize people with disabilities. And at the time, the chair commented, wouldn't it be helpful if law enforcement could identify certain people with disabilities or conditions before law enforcement approaches the situation? And with some help with some retired techie people, that has happened. Um, I'll be brief, and so with me to testify in favor of the bill and answer any questions is Jillian Nelson from Awesome and St. Paul Police Department Sergeant Peter Zink. Good uh, afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee uh, members. My name is Jillian Nelson, and I am the Community Resource and Policy Advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. I am also an autistic adult, and I'm here to speak with you today, and it's, it happens to be World Autism Day, so it's a very fitting day for this discussion um, about Senate File 1158. Um, this bill does have two components, so I'm going to briefly go over both of them. Um, autistic people are seven times more likely to be the victim of a crime because of vulnerability and 12 times more likely to become involved in the criminal justice system without criminal intent. This bill was modeled around the COP Autism Response Education Program, or CARE, developed here in St. Paul. This program has been groundbreaking in ending this cycle, and this is a type of training that this bill is hoping to extend throughout the state. CARE pairs with knowledgeable autism experts to teach the basics of autism and how to support someone with autism. And then the officers learn how to follow up and build trust and relationships with individuals with autism and their families. This approach not only improves safety for the community and officers, but it also increases inclusion and fosters community integration. I have been privileged to be a part of this training as a trainer in the classrooms and as a resident to see firsthand how officers engage with the information and work with our community. This bill will also offer access to law enforcement additional mobile technology. I have been the user of one of these tools, Vitals, since the very inception. What this app does is it allows a user to carry a small card, nothing more than this, to digitally disclose to law enforcement about their disability using Bluetooth technology. When I come within 30 to 100 feet of an officer using this app, they get a ping and it shows them a profile containing information that I decided to disclose about my disability de-escalation strategies, behavioral triggers, and emergency contact information. Users can even include a video or a sound file on their profile. This application has been instrumental in keeping me safe when interacting with law enforcement on multiple occasions. Um, one was an incident at Mall of America. I was having a meltdown, and a store manage, manager called security to handle me even though I advised that that would only increase the situation. I just needed what I needed, and I would go. When they arrived, I was surrounded by four officers, and they were prepared to tase me because that was how they were trained to handle with me. This app, this app was not out of the pilot process at that time. It was only being used by a handful of officers in St. Paul, but they knew what it was, and I offered them my own cell phone with my caregiver app on it. It took about 30 seconds of them looking at that app for them to realize that I was not someone that needed to be arrested. I did not need to be tased. I did not need to be trespassed. I needed to be helped. I needed support and help, and they were able to offer that and have, for me to have a successful experience and get home safely as a person with autism. This app is going to reduce trauma and it's going to increase community integration. And we are happy to demonstrate how it works if the committee is interested. Continuing to expand the education and offer tools like this is a common sense step to creating an accessible and safe community for Minnesota residents. We have been a long time leader in disability services and Minnesota is ranked in the top three places in the country to live as a person with autism because of programs like this. The Autism Society of Minnesota strongly supports this program, and we're asking today for your support as well, so that we can continue to work on expanding this training and this application statewide. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, next will be St. Paul Zink. Police Officer <laughs> Rob Zink. Hi, I'm Officer Robert Zink with the St. Paul Police Department. Um, several years ago, we started in about 2014, 2015, the City of St. Paul had a rash of incidents involving uh, adults and kids on the autism spectrum. Um, the results of those incidents didn't turn out well. Um, I was brought in as a father of two boys on the spectrum by a now Deputy Chief Paul Ivino, who brought us in and said, hey, we as St. Paul Police need to do something about this. And after initially dealing with those initial four or five incidences, 
we expanded and said, hey, we need to reach out to all the autistic contacts we've had in the city of St. Paul. From there, we built the CARE program that stands for COPS Autism Response Education. And it's an interactive program that also not only just cha trains police officers, but also teaches the parents and those on the autism spectrum what to expect when dealing with law enforcement. Uh, we've done multiple trainings throughout the state, through multiple cities, and the primary focus of this would we get funding so other agencies are able to provide the, the, the training and actually have more training for their officers. This is personal for me because I've seen bad incidents that's happened with those on the spectrum. I have a 13-year-old son who is bigger than me. I'm 6'1", 250 pounds. My son is about six foot, 280 pounds, built like an NFL linebacker. My son is 13 years old. He looks like he's 22 or 23 years old, but he has the mentality of a five-year-old. And if he, I, his interaction with law enforcement, if someone as an, a cop would assess him as a large 23-year-old man, not understanding which he's basically dealing with a five-year-old. I'm a cop and I fear without proper training, something may happen to my own son. And with that, that's why I do this. I wanna make sure officers understand what they need to do for autism, especially on those calls where you're dealing with meltdowns. And I'll, I'll, and I'll appeal to everyone's monetary needs. The reality is we have 12, roughly 12,000 police officers in the state of Minnesota. If just once in their careers they go through this training, and since the majority of the people and the clients who are on the autism spectrum are receiving MA from the state of Minnesota, if just once in their careers they're able to avoid one trip to the hospital via ambulance or anything else like that, that a typical cost of an ambulance ride and a trip to the ER is well over $3,000. If it's just once in their careers, that's a savings of $36 million to the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Officer Zink. Um, is there any questions? Senator Ralph. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, and thank you, Senator Dizik, for bringing this forward. I have one question about the, the language in the bill. Uh, as I understand it, it, it appears that we're only talking about training people in this, to the, the police to under, use the app and then to respond appropriately. Or is the training to be expanded to allow just police officers and law enforcement people to understand autism and how to respond to it or recognize the symptoms uh, because they may not have the app or the person may not have it. And so I'm wondering if this, if this is a more expansive grant or is it just related to the app? Um, the, the appropriation is set up to allow That's the departments awesome. to choose what they need to better serve. So if the department feels that what they need is ongoing training, such as the care training, that's what they can apply for. If they have the care training, because it has spread throughout the state of Minnesota, but they feel that they need more support in mobile technology, they can apply for the grant to receive that. So we're, we're leaving it open for departments to understand what needs are best going to ser serve their communities. Any other questions? Can I expand on that? Um, one of the things that we've looked at with doing training... Officer part, Zink. Sorry. Uh, one of the things we've looked at and we've taken overall picture, 40%, roughly 40% of all officers in the state of Minnesota work for large departments. And of those large departments, almost the large departments generally handle their own training. And with that, with 40% of the officers in those large departments uh, doing a train the trainer program and providing the trainers to the large departments for a relatively small cost, you could, you're able to train 40% of the officers in the state of Minnesota just by providing the trainers to those large departments. All right. Senator Anderson, did you have any questions? Oh, Mr. Chair, uh, I have in my packet here a... a uh, from the Minnesota Autism Council, assigned um, chairperson and policy liaison. And the same person has also sent us a letter in our packet uh, in regards to this uh, legislation, 1158. And I'm just wondering if someone can explain why one on the uh, form here where he signed as a policy liaison, he supports it, and then in a letter he doesn't support it, and I'm just curious as to why 
that is, uh, and I don't see a date on this letter, so I don't know when this, but it, it references Senate File 1158, so I'm just, it's kind of ironic. Sarah, do you think, do you have um, Mr. Chair, I became aware of the letter um, early this morning, so I think that is a recent letter, and um, I'm not positive for the reason, so. Um. Um, I will point out also that in, so this is one of those, as um, Senator Rood said, Groundhog Day bills. We've had it before us um, before, and, and again, specifically, it started with just training officers to recognize cues for people that have, um, that are on the autism spectrum. But as far as the, we've, we've since then um, expanded it to also include the app, and we've also heard from other first responders, and it's, you know, the person could be a, have a seizure disorder, have any number of, um, you know, maladies or conditions that you don't recognize right away when just actually looking at the person that could be input in the app. So if the law enforcement or first responders come across somebody that is um, passed out, they could find out, do they have um, diabetes? Do they have seizures? Do they have other, other issues? So it is just broader than um, autism spectrum as well. So uh, thank is you. There a, is there a Mr. Noah McCourt in the room? He's here. Mm -hmm. uh, could you come down to the table? We're going to go over the limit just a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. McCourt, um, there was an observation made that you signed two letters, one in support and one in opposition to this bill. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, I signed a letter um, in my former capacity as the um, policy liaison of the Minnesota Autism Council. Um, my, I was recently made aware um, of some concerns with the Vitals app um, coming from um, prosecutors um, as far as probable cause and what a there's some things that I think still need to be fleshed out with the app. Um, I'm fully in support of the training. Um, as, I, as I stated, my concern is that the Vitals app is being marketed as the end-all solution. And I, I have, um, I've seen that in action where certain departments are getting the um, app and they are not necessarily trained as far as the information with what to do with that app. And so from the point of pragmatism, I really would like to see the Vitals app um, as a separate bill so we can ensure that training, um, that they have tra both the information and the baseline knowledge of what to do with that training. Can so, I respond to that, please? Uh, no. Uh, uh, Mr. McCourt, um, so is it safe for me to conclude that in your former capacity you were for this concept and now you no longer represent that organization? In and, my this former, is, and this is an opinion of your, your own? Yes, the policy liaison is a former capacity. All right, all right. We're kind of out of time, but we will lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Thank and you, Senator Mr. Chair. Dietzik, I just wanted to thank you. You're, I, I now know there's one person who listens to the chairman <laughs> once in a while. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next bill is Senator, Dietzik, or Senator uh, Ingerbitson. We'll be going over our time for the room, but I think we can squeeze in the last two provisions. Senator Ingrid. Mr. Chair, you know how brief I can be. Oh yeah, Senate, we have a long record of that. Senate file 904. <laughs> uh, a very short bill, some very big numbers on that as you notice, uh, but a very good program and I'm going to uh, in your packet, you have support from the Sheriff's Association, the Chiefs of Police, I believe, Minnesota Chiefs, uh, as well as the County Attorneys and the Minnesota Juvenile Officers uh, Association for the Youth Inter uh, Intervention Program, the YIP program that's been around for some time. And I'm going to turn it over to my testifiers right away, if I could. All right. Uh, Ms. Stacy Collier. Hello. Yes. Um, I'm here today to share with you a little bit of my personal story. Um, Would you mind identifying yourself oh, for the record? Yes, thank you. My name is Stacy Collier. 
and I am a program director with the YMCA of the Greater right. Twin Cities. Great, thank you. Please proceed. Yes. Um, so I'm here to share with you a little bit of uh, my story of how I came to be um, before you and why this bill um, is so important not only to myself, but to um, thousands of young people in the state of Minnesota. So if you've had a chance to look over the bill, you know that this bill focuses on providing programs and access and supportive services on the early onsets of young people who are at risk of um, getting involved in particular behaviors that could lead them to being a threat to our communities um, and to um, our civilians. And so my upbringing uh, paints me as an individual that should be one of those individuals that um, are causing those harms in the community. I come from a background of a low-income family. Um, I come from a family who has a history of incarceration as well as um, severe drug abuse and addiction. And so my upbringing has uh, put me in the position of being statistic of I should be in a facility, um, maybe even a jail facility, and I have family members that that is their reality. I have peers that that is their reality. The big turning point for me as to why I'm sitting in front of you today um, as a contributing concerned citizen um, out there in the community doing a lot of work with young people is because at fifth grade, a program partnering with my school came in after school. And those caring adults provided me not only with a safe environment, but they also provided me with an outlook on life that I hadn't seen before. When I'd go home, it was violence and it was crime. Um, and I would see people living out those types of activities. And I've experienced and been uh, vulnerable to lots of types of crime and abuse myself because of those environments. Going to school, they showed me the importance of education. They showed me the importance of advocating for myself. And they showed me the importance of not following the path that has been shown before me for majority of my uh, formative years. And so I was able to have that support, not only from fifth grade, um, but to present day as well. And so those same adults are the adults that are still within the organization that I now work for, the YMCA. And those adults help to keep me on path. I have numerous amounts of peers from my junior high years and my high school years that are no longer with us from their addiction to drugs. Um, they're serving life sentences in prison for violent crimes, uh, that have stricken our community, uh, as well as taken away from their potential that they could have had in this community. And so my life took a different path because of those caring adults that came in. Um, before, when I was in kindergarten to second grade, I missed a total of 200 to 250 days of school. Um, I was not supposed to graduate college. I was not supposed to be on track. Um, I'm not supposed to be uh, where I am today when I look at my peers and where they are. That's a big testament to the power of caring adults intervening in the onset because we know that young people are being exposed every single day um, to hardships and realities. And as we know from our experience in knowing how young people grow up, what you're exposed to becomes your reality. And if you're not exposed outside of that, how are you going to be productive citizens? And so. The YIP funding um, is actually funding that I receive in a partnership with the City of Brooklyn Park and the police. And so we work together to identify young people who are coming from similar backgrounds and who are at high risk. And we work as a collaborative team to address the needs of the community, um, which is something that all communities need. And this funding makes that available. And so those young people are now getting those same types of services that I received when I was younger that helped to put me on the straight and narrow and helped me to avoid taking up good taxpayer dollars somewhere where I don't need to be. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll move on to Mr. Paul Munier. And uh, you have about five minutes left. I can do it in less than that if you'd like. My name is Paul Munier. I'm the executive director of the Youth Intervention Programs Association. I've had the opportunity to speak to everybody on the committee numerous times about the, the, the benefit of youth intervention and helping the kids that society sees as at very high risk of being adults who are consuming our services. And somehow we have to figure out 
how to prevent the cost of government from just going up. And one of the things you can do is cut programs or you can stop the demand for services. And I think that's what youth intervention does, and I believe that's what Stacy is a perfect uh, testimony of. Um, the other thing I, I really want to emphasize here is that we're not asking the state to solve this problem. We think this is a community-based problem. These kids have to get connected to their community. I think it's really simple to think of it this way. If kids look around and they, they're not connected and they don't have those adults in their life that are caring for them and holding them accountable, they either do one of two things. They either act out or withdraw. And the kids that act out are the ones that are throwing bricks through windows, and the kids that withdraw are the ones that are doing drugs and, and developing mental health issues. The secret to all this stuff doesn't have to be complicated. It's having somebody in your life that can provide you a caring and meaningful relationship so that you feel like there's a, a, some other destiny than what you see in front of you, that you can take control of your life and do things that you want to do. Members, there's 300,000 youth like this in the state of Minnesota, and we are not touching them. And the, the graph I have here that uh, with the biennium spending of just corrections alone, not taking in the BCA or guardian ad litems or the other items in your program, but the spending keeps going up, and we're not, it should surprise nobody that we need to put a big flux of money into corrections and more things like that. And it seems like your job is public safety, and that's what we're trying to help you do. We, can, I, we know who these kids are. We can help many of them <laughs> not be incarcerated, drug addicts, you know, things of, of that nature. So... Uh, Mr. Chair, I would ask you to uh, seriously figure out some way that we can find some funding so we can touch more kids and help them become productive members of society. So thank you. I think I did that in like three or four minutes. Not bad. We should have put you as an example in the very front of the bill list today, mm -hmm. Paul. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. And uh, we will lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Ingridson. Thank Gritson. you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to Thank Senate you, File 2034. Thank you, Welcome to your committee. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Senate File 2034 is a bill that we've heard similar to an effort that we did two years ago. Um, this is the uh, bill to create a supplemental account for nonprofit security Mr. grant Mr. programs. Chairman, would you introduce yourself to the tape? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Warren Limmer. I live in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Right now, I'm not the chairman of this committee, <laughs> and uh, I am introducing Senate File 2034. Um, I would like to first thank uh, the co-authors on this particular bill. I'd like to thank, thank uh, Senator Paul Gazelka, Tom Bach, Senator Cohen, and Senator Latz, who have joined me in this effort. Um, this is a project that has begun two years ago, and it recreates a one-time state competitive grant opportunity for nonprofit organizations, which may be at risk of being victims of violent extremism, and to partner with the state to improve their security infrastructure by supplementing an ongoing federal grant program through the Department of Homeland Security. One may ask, why is this legislation needed? Well, recent terror attacks against houses of worship, including the 2018 shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, highlight the clear need for a strong partnership between law enforcement, elected officials, and communities, which are at an increased risk of being the victim of terrorism. Since 2007, the federal government, through the Nonprofit Security Grant po Program, has partnered with at-risk nonprofit organizations 
that serve community centers to help them acquire and install equipment to secure themselves against a potential homegrown violent extremist, extremist attack. These capital improvement, improvements funded through the federal grant program include upgraded security measures, such as installing fencing or bollards or lighting, video surveillance, metal detection equipment, access controls, blast proofing and hardening of doors and windows and cyber security measures. Sadly, this bill reflects really a sign of our times. Uh, while this federal program is useful, there continues to be a substantial deficit between what is still needed to keep our at-risk Minnesota nonprofits safe and the federal funding that is available to Minnesota. It is this deficit that Senate File 2034 addresses by providing a one-time supplemental fund to qualified at-risk Minnesota institutions which apply for the federal funds but do not receive less than 1% of all available federal funds which are directed to Minnesota each year. I have with me uh, today uh, individuals who wish to speak in favor of this bill. And uh, thank I, you. I believe you have thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, a list of those who wish to speak. Uh, who would like to start first and please introduce yourself? I will. My name is Anthony Sussman and I work at the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota the Dakotas. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you members of the committee for your consideration of Senate File 2034 today. Thank you Chair Limmer for your leadership on this important legislation and thank you Senator Latz for co-authoring this legislation and your leadership as well. As I said, my name is Anthony Sussman and I work at the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. I've been there for 13 years working in the areas of community security and communications. The JCRC is the liaison between the Jewish community and law enforcement. We track anti-Semitic incidents, prepare our community for emergencies, and we also advise other faith communities on best security practices. Incidents such as the 2017 bombing of the Dar al-Farouk Islamic Center in Bloomington and the 2018 shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh highlight the clear need for a strong partnership between government institutions and communities which are at an increased risk of being the victim of violent extremism. It should go without saying, but all faith communities in the United States should feel safe gathering in their respect, respective prayer spaces. In 2017, the FBI, according to the FBI, hate crimes increased overall by 17%. The number of hate crimes based on religion is the second highest ever. There was a 23% increase in religion-based hate crimes, representing about 20% of all hate crimes. We know that these incidents are still underreported. The Jewish community deeply appreciates the resources, expertise, and concern that local, state, and federal law enforcement have committed to addressing these disturbing acts. To confront these threats, federal, state, and private resources are required. Senate File 2034 will help ensure that Minnesota's at-risk nonprofit organizations will have adequate resources to address these threats. Since 2007, the Federal Nonprofit Security Grant Program is a bipartisan initiative that awards at-risk nonprofits up to $150,000 for target hardening activities. This money helps at-risk nonprofits purchase physical security enhancement equipment and inspection and screening systems, much of the equipment that Senator Limmer outlined. Certain costs for training of security personnel are also permitted. In 2018, applicants were invited to apply from the Twin Cities as well as the rest of the state. There is a $50 million pool for designated urban areas and $10 million for the rest of the country. The Twin Cities are the only designated urban area in Minnesota. This will be the same in 2019. All at-risk nonprofit organizations in Minnesota can apply for this funding. While this federal program is very useful, there continues to be a substantial deficit between what is still needed to keep our at-risk Minnesota nonprofit safe and funding that is available. Senate File 2034 will bolster the federal nonprofit security grant program with state funds. We are grateful for those federal funds, but the Twin Cities area, one of over 30 designated urban areas eligible for funding, is at a competitive disadvantage when compared to cities like Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York City, 
and Los Angeles. Given the current threat environment, these funding opportunities will become even more competitive. In Minnesota, the nonprofit security grant program is administered through Homeland Security and Emergency Management, a division of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Minnesota's HSEM professionals already select local applicants to compete for these federal nonprofit security grants. Unfortunately, only a handful of Minnesota applicants receive funding each year. This legislation provides at-risk nonprofits that do not receive federal funding an opportunity to receive state funding for critical security measures. The purpose of this legislation, which is very similar to a bipartisan bill the legislature passed in 2017, is to supplement these federal funds with state dollars on a one-time basis. Because it is important that every available dollar go to protecting at-risk communities, Senate File 2034 reduces administrative costs by requiring HSEM to use these state funds to grant money to the most qualified but unsuccessful applicants for the federal grant program. This avoids the need for a separate state application process as HSEM is instructed to provide the state funds to the applicants which scored the highest on their initial evaluation but did not receive the federal funds. In 2017, this meant that several Minnesota nonprofits which had unsuccessfully applied for the federal funding were able to receive straight state dollars to make their facilities more secure. If Senate File 2034 is included in the budget, we will send a strong message that Minnesota is ready and willing to partner with our nonprofits to harden themselves against violent extremism and secure our vulnerable, vulnerable communities together. With the increased demand for security resources in the Jewish community, the JCRC hired its first full-time director of community security in October 2018, Dan Pleckenpohl. Dan had a distinguished 30-year career in law enforcement. He has not only been a tremendous asset to the Jewish community, but to other faith communities as well. We are fortunate to have Dan's experience and expertise. Thank you for your consideration today. Thank you, Mr. Sussman. Uh, Mr. Pleckenpohl, if you'd address yourself, uh, give us your name for the tape and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, members of the committee, good afternoon. I am Dan Pleckenpohl, the Director of Community Security for the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. And I am here in support of Senate File 2034. I have over 30 years of experience as a law enforcement officer with the City of Plymouth, the last 10 in the position of Deputy Chief of Police. Um, after retirement, I was hired by the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council, um, with the goal to enhance the level of security within the Jewish community and to be a resource to other at-risk communities. During my six-month tenure with the JCRC, I've developed a concern over the large amount of anti-Semitic and hate incidents targeting other faith-based organizations. Law enforcement administration is not fully aware of the breadth of these incidents due in part from a lack of reporting from the faith-based communities and line officers not always recognizing and reporting certain incidents as bias-motivated crimes. Thus far, in 2019, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension has 13 bias-motivated crimes reported from law enforcement agencies throughout the state. As for anti-Semitic incidents, Statistically, 2017, there were 28. 2018, there were 24. And in 2019, so far, in the first three months, there are 11 such incidents reported. I have re performed 30 security risk assessments and 21 trainings, including other faith-based organizations. The latest outreach beyond the Jewish community is an upcoming security assessment to be formed at the Mexican consulate facility here in the Twin Cities. Our mindset for our work within our community and outreach to others has been to retain a warm and welcoming environment as well as a safe and secure facility. We are partnering with the Interfaith Action of Greater St. Paul to offer security assessments and training to the broader faith-based community. I had the opportunity to train their staff recently. In February, we presented at the Governor's Conference hosted by Minnesota Homeland Security and Emergency Management to discuss best practice security for houses of worship, concentrating on not remaining in our silos with ideas expressed on how to conduct successful outreach. 
Additionally, we have teamed with our federal partners to present a best practices for physical security at houses of worship. The partners are the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Homeland Security, and the U.S. Postal Inspector. Presentations have been conducted in Minneapolis, Rochester, Apple Valley, Sioux Falls, and then Fargo for this coming June. Security training and assessments and newly formed relationships have clearly identified several physical security related enhancements needed to harden houses of worship from domestic and foreign threats and actions. I have seen firsthand the necessity for physical security initiatives throughout a diverse community. There are certain essential baseline physical security tools that all houses of worship need to be and to feel safe. Congregate volunteers are used by many houses of worship to assist with security, but they are no replacement for essential physical security tools. As a former law enforcement professional, we appreciate when institutions are more self-reliant by having the ability to target harden their own facilities. But there are real costs associated with this comprehensive measure, which many lack the resources to attain an acceptable level of safety. Security is the common thread amongst all houses of worship and the key component to start conversations and to build lasting relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plekavo. Um, members, are there questions or for the Senator Ingebrigtsen? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, too, as a retired law enforcement, appreciate the testifier uh, just that, that just finished, and, and I, I'm very concerned um, with the anti-Semitic uh, things that are going on in our, in our, not only our country, but our state especially. <clears throat> and I was taken back by the security audit, I believe it was, of the the uh, synagogue after the synagogue shooting in in Pittsburgh, and I was just happening to watch a a news article about that, and they had a security specialist there that was being interviewed, and they said that they were taking security measures. And I even nudged my wife, who uh, I said, "Just let's pay attention to this because this could be something that that might be of interest to the uh, to way to some way to." address this horrible thing that happened. And the security person seemed to be a very professional professional man, um, said that they were going to have the security measures that he took were that they were going to have tourniquets on hand. And I, I just about fell off the couch. And, and, the re and, and the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because I was, I was taken aback by um, how that was dealt with, how that was, I mean, how you would even get on. Um, it was just really hard for me to, to, to understand how that was their way of answering to that, to that horrible, horrible incident that happened. And I... I say that only only knowing that I know there's a lot of churches, and, and I was going to ask, you're talking about nonprofits, but you, you did mention houses of worship uh, in, in the state, and, and I belong to one of them that has, has a security measures set up now. They, they, uh, we, people throughout the church have, have uh, uh, un, no first aid, and they're able to respond, and they're checking the doors during, during the... Uh, the uh, Worship, and we take turns, and, and actually we have armed people in the church. And what a terrible thing to have to do when I think about it. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's part of the discussion. I know hardening and, and making secure doors and windows, I get all that. But are we, are we missing the, the, the ability to stop a threat because we're just afraid to put Something that can, something that we're going to call law enforcement to do, and that's to stop the threat once the shooting starts. Are we afraid to move that direction? Or can you give me some comments about that, Mr. Sure. Black and Pull? Absolutely, thank you. Um, we do. We really look for the JCRC. We really have a balanced approach. What we like to do is to work with local law enforcement so that they can be included um, for larger events 
and um, they could always be hired or work in partnership with the houses of worship. But we also want to instill upon different houses of worship their own responsibility to have training, and we afford training for their staff, to um, for ushers, for greeters, to um, um, look for suspicious behavior, um, to go by an acronym of I can contact, ask, and notify. Um, basically, see something, say something, um, so that if someone is going to be coming to a facility beforehand, and they can at least be. Um, um, talk with a greeter that asks them questions and they know that they're going to be at least um, 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 there's security there, there's going to be something that's noticing, there's something that's taking them aside in essence that's seeing that they maybe um, are not belonging there and new there, that they may not be a facility that they want to come back to. Um, so a deterrent, so to speak, that could be in those particular circumstances. So it's really a balanced approach between physical security and also training staff to be responsible for themselves. Senator Ingebrigtsen, follow follow-up. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I understand looking for that person that, that might not be stable, that might, you know, might all of a sudden bear you know, notification of the other ushers, let's be watching this person a little closer. But that doesn't seem to be enough to me. It just doesn't. And I, and I know people are reluctant to talk about this, but it's happening. Uh, there, there are churches that are, that are having uh, armed uh, folks that, that go through the proper procedures and know how to handle a weapon that are actually sitting in the churches during, during, uh, uh, during the, the hour that, that many folks, along with children, come to, to worship. And, Unfortunately, we, have, we, we are in that, that era, and uh, I, I would suggest strongly that you do that as well, and, or at least you know, be open to those that may want to do that, churches, synagogues, whoever. So just my comments. Mr. Plekapo. Uh, Senator Ingerbritson, um, we leave that up to the individual synagogues to make that choice for their congregations uh, and their houses of worship if they want to have persons that are trained um, in the use of firearms, uh, that's going to be their particular individual choice. Um, you know, so um, we leave that up to them. One piece to think about that I like to talk about uh, is when the firearms are introduced and there are people who are trained that can shoot and they can be an ac accurate shooter, uh, which is all fine and good, and even yourself knowing coming from far, former law enforcement, when um, they're they're never trained on shooting when their heart beats up to 160 beats per minute. And they're not thinking about the um, target behind the target. Um, they don't usually have a whole lot of training in shooting on the move or shooting moving targets. And also, they sometimes don't have a lot of training on shoot, don't shoot decisions. So those are some things, and weapon retention, how to keep my weapon away from someone who wants to take it from me. So those are concerns, uh, I would say. Uh, and they're layered concerns for houses of worship to think about before they take on a particular program of having their congregates um, carrying firearms uh, within their facility. Senator Ingebrigtsen. And Mr. Chair, I agree 100 percent. They really have to have some, some, some decent training. I mean, there's not just, okay, I'm going to carry a gun this week and I'm going to protect the church. Absolutely not, knowing that that gun could be taken away and, and utilized. And, and again, people behind, you know, I, I understand that. But when the shooting starts, we call on law enforcement to come and stop that threat. And unfortunately, that's going to take somebody shooting the assailant. And if something can be, you know, a chance at all, I think that's what folks are looking for. So um, we just shouldn't stand in the way of that. But it has to be done right, I agree. Senator Limmer, last words. Well, Mr. Chair, um, we've kind of gone uh, or expanded quite a bit away from, uh, from the effort of this particular bill. But nevertheless, I would move that we uh, lay this bill over for possible inclusion in the budget bill. Senator Limmer moves that Senate file 2034 be recommended to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And uh, thank you, Senator Nummer, and thank you for your testimony, uh, both the, the people that came to testify. So, uh, members, with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned.